Yes. Well, welcome everyone. Very good to see you, and I'm glad nobody had problems joining in. Um, I'm just going to start with a brief uh, overview, and uh, then we'll take it go around the screen. I was going to say the room. Um, today, there are an estimated 272 million international migrants, which uh, accounts for about 3.5% of the world's population. Now, this figure is a very small percentage on its own, but it's worthwhile to note that it uh, surpasses the projections made for the year 2050, which was 2.6% or 230 million. In recent times, however, it's been non-economic pressures like civil wars, religious persecution, and natural disasters that have pushed uh, migration into the center stage, both in the media and political debate around the world. But economic migration still accounts for the majority of movement across the globe. And somehow the current narrative has somewhat driven the focus away from the fact that economic and social benefits of migration are indeed manifold. Now, one of the oldest seen issues in global migration patterns is the high concentration of immigrants in certain countries, industries, and occupations. Now, this results in increased anxiety, insecurity, and possibly major short-term disruptions among native-born workers, as we've been seeing around the world. Add to this mix, recession, falling oil prices, which particularly holds true in the GCC region where I am, and COVID-19, and we are adding fuel to the fire. It also doesn't help uh, that in the destination labor markets, the positive effect and the benefits of migration tend to be more diffused, whereas the costs are more concentrated and quite easily identifiable and attributable to immigration. The whole us versus them debate becomes a useful tool to shift the focus from underlying issues and uh, seems also to be a seemingly easy fix to immediate problems like unemployment among the national workforce. Now, we usually tend to discuss uh, migration as a governmental policy issue, but let us just look at it from the PPP angle just for a bit, you know, public-private partnership. Now, on the corporate side, businesses have slowly broadened its focus from profit maximization to the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. And while people and planet-focused sustainability initiatives have become standard practice in corporations across the world, migration, however, is often overlooked as a factor within a company's overall sustainability strategy. Now, this oversight is critical as migration invariably impacts business and to ensure that its influence remains positive, this requires leaders to be aware and engage. Now, migration can offer opportunities within each aspect of the triple bottom line, for instance, by creating a diverse and competent workforce, uh, fostering innovation across borders, and also creating global strategies in environmental sustainability. But without cross-sectoral collaboration between the public and private sectors, it's unlikely to work. Now, the profits created through this nexus may not be direct, but as we all know, they are abundant. So if you just take the importance of remittances, uh, for example, global financial remittances to developing countries far outstrips all official development assistance to them. And in return, the destination countries profit from uh, social remittances, you know, the flow of skills, knowledge, and so on, that the migrants bring. And this has been especially significant in the field of education and healthcare. So I would say that a holistic approach to labor migration governance, which is a whole of government and the whole of society approach, could better help prepare governments for a changing uh, landscape that we are all seeing. But this, again, needs improved coherence and coordination between migration and employment policies. I suppose it would be safe to say that ignoring the massive uh, economic gains of immigration would be somewhat would be some like life. leaving billions of, you know, $100 bills on the sidewalk. And on that happy note, um, I'm going to ask each one of you to briefly introduce yourself before we go on to the main discussion. Um, mm. If we take it alphabetically, can we start with you, Egaman? Sure. 
My name is Egemen Harish. I'm the Turkish ambassador in the capital of the Czech Republic. And I've served as Turkey's Minister for European Affairs and Turkey's Chief Negotiator to the United to the European Union for many years. I also serve at the uh, high level advisory group of the United Nations Alliance of Civilization. And migration is a that I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, can we go on to you now? Thank you. Um, thanks, Mohana. Thanks for the panel. It's wonderful to join with you today. Um, immigration is uh, an important issue. Being an immigrant myself, moved to the US 25 years back from India, came uh, on the advisory board for a number of banks in the US, as well as on the advisory board for startup and fintech companies. And also, I joined part of the, uh, the USP level program. Uh, I interact closely with immigrants and the immigration cause, how it shapes the economy. So, I'm glad to share my views both the international and the US immigration point in the future. Thank you. Royston? I think migration has been with us for thousands of years. It's not a new phenomenon. Uh, it's amazing how. People move because of fear and also for economic uh, criteria. And I do believe that we need to find a mechanism for inclusion rather than uh, um, and celebrate diversity. Much of this is helping people to understand what they can do rather than what they can't do. And I think in the economic context, it's about helping people to discover their potential because they're all agents of possibility. Um, and I think it, if you have humanity and you look at uh, the world with a notion of loving kindness as your starting place, then I think you have an opportunity to celebrate rather than look at it as a destructive process. Dr. Singh? Uh, thank you, Mohina. Uh, my name is Dr. Sulat Singh. I am a Supreme Court lawyer in India from a simple, uneducated farmer's family of Haryana in India. I went up to Oxford, did my doctor of laws uh, from Harvard, taught comparative constitutions at Oxford and at Delhi University. Now I am in the Supreme Court practice. And this journey itself, that imagine a person born in an uneducated farmer's family whose both parents were formerly not educated and whose family income was hardly $1,000 a year. And today, arguably one of the highest educated <laughs> lawyer of India with two degrees from Harvard, one from Oxford, two from <laughs> Delhi University, and making thousand times more than what my parents used to do. So in one lifetime, if it is possible to improve thousand times, then migration and education have a lot of advantages. So that's why I'm recommending that let there be universal right to access and development, what I call uh, the road, our right of access and development. And as uh, Mohina rightly pointed out, there's an enormous scope for private public partnership in this area, which remains unutilized. Okay. Um, and now, can we uh, start with you now? I mean, well, the elections are coming up, and uh, I think it's going to be exciting times in the US. Now, you're in New York. Now, in context of the US, how feasible is a labor market oriented, economically motivated rationale against political opposition to migration? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, we just uh, happened the first uh, election debate day for us today. Uh, it was an interesting times. Uh, being an apolitical, but the impact of the political outcome is definitely shapes the immigration. Uh, when you look at the, the U.S. Uh, migration uh, in, in the last uh, 100 plus years, uh, first it was 80% of the European migrants came to the U.S. around 1900s, uh, one-fifth of the population, around 40 million people population of the immigrants in the U.S., uh, contributes economic development, which is one fifth of the global GDP, which is almost $21 trillion. So the impact of the 
the immigrants' contributions, both from the job creation as well as uh, the, the growth of the economy, I think it's enormous. You can't deny that factor. Uh, having said that, uh, the business leaders today, especially the last one, two, three years, both from the business roundtable as well as the uh, uh, World Economic Forum, the UN General Assembly, so all combined together, we're talking about uh, promoting and sign the pledge for uh, stakeholder capitalism or the activism, helping uh, the social responsibility for all, not just shareholders point of view. So it combines the suppliers, customers, employees, everybody together. <clears throat> I think in my view, where I strongly support the women contribution on the employment and the immigration actually plays a greater role for a sustainability in the future. So I myself as part of the group where we come on 50 percent or more women on the property boards. Uh, so we are expecting at least by 2025, there'll be 50 percent of the SFP companies have more women on the boards. Uh, so that will actually is, is a change that we will see from the employment point of view, uh, how the growth aspect point of view, as well as the sustainability point of view. So, uh, there are a few aspects where the marketplace, like environmental sustainability and governance, the ESG in the next 10 years, how we wanted to build. That's the one area. Obviously, the world today, is when you look at the COVID, the entire the world economy is moving toward the digitization. As we are in the digital footprint, we are literally on the Wi-Fi, on the connectivity. I think that's another opportunity areas where the market growth is. So I think the market is realigned itself. But the immigration plays an important role. Again, coming back to my first statement, elections definitely plays an important role when you come back in January, um, whichever the administration. I think that shapes the conversation. I hope we continue the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. And in fact, uh, we will come back to a couple of those points uh, later. Um, to move to a completely different, I mean, you know, we talked about economic and non-economic pressures when we move to Egaman. Now, Egaman, Turkey, well, your country is not a stranger to the whole migration process. I mean, you all start with the large labor immigration to Western Europe in the 60s. But in recent years, there's been a transformation of Turkey from an emigration into an immigration and a transit country. Now, how is Turkey dealing with this challenge? And what has it meant for business as well? Because ultimately we will come back to that. Sorry, uh, actually Turkish experience with migration started even earlier than the 60s. Uh, in 1492, when Jews were expelled from Spain, Turkey was the only country to allow them in, and they contributed a lot to our flourishment. When the Poles were prosecuted, uh, they came to Turkey, and in Istanbul, we have a town called, a, a neighborhood called Polonoske, where the third or the fourth generation Polish Turks speak Turkish and Polish, and they have a mosque and a church side by side, and uh, their elected representatives are all very fluent in uh, Polish language. And every time there's an election in Poland, the candidates come to Istanbul to campaign because their citizens abroad can also vote. Uh, when Saddam was gassing the Kurd to death, uh, they escaped to Turkey and they opened our arms. Even many came to Turkey during Shah regime, and from Turkey he went on to friends from where we went back to claim power in Tehran. So our experience is quite uh, old, but as you mentioned in the 60s, there was a very huge wave of Turks going to Europe as guest workers. And today in Germany, we have approximately 4 million Turks uh, with the, not only the those who went, but their kids and their grandkids. Now, Turkish Germans are playing in the national football team of Germany. Uh, Turkish movie directors are getting the awards for the best German movies. And Turkish surgeons are conducting operations on German hospitals. So uh, they have integrated quite well. But recently we have a, an immigration issue coming mainly from Syria and some from Afghanistan and Pakistan and uh, 
other countries in the region. Um, and Turkey has been hosting them. As we speak right now, we have 4.5 million refugees in Turkey. Some of them are living in tent cities. Some of them are living in the cities. Some of them have integrated. Some of them are still trying to integrate. Uh, but most of them have the hope to go to Western European countries. And Turkey has been quite successful in making sure they don't cross the border. And we have been spending a lot of effort and financial resources to care for their needs, like food, shelter, education, health. And we have spent more than $40 billion dollars in the last six years in dealing with this crisis. We were promised uh, that some of that burden would be assumed by European Union. They have sent some to some European agencies, but have not really reached the Syrian migrants or the Turkish NGOs who are dealing with the I think we just lost Egeman mm. for a bit. Yeah. Hopefully he will be back soon. Okay. I think what we'll do is that we will move on and then uh, come back to Egeman when he logs back on. Um, Royston. Now, one of the things that, you know, we discussed this before, the rising trend of um, aging societies. Yeah, we talked about that. A result of decreased fertility rates, longer life expectancies, very different from the kind of uh, problems that we're seeing in the developing nations. Now, what role do you see migration uh, playing here in, you know, the impact, alleviating the impact of declining labor force in such countries? Well, I mean, clearly it's a, a catastrophic situation in some countries. Yeah. I mean, although I would suggest that uh, the Ikigai concept from Japan, where everybody has a part to play, is probably worth considering. So rather than writing people off because of an age, you actually celebrate the experience. Um, what we're discovering, which is quite interesting, some of the work that we're doing, I should have said earlier, I'm president of a UN NGO looking at self-sustaining solutions but I'm also a member of an old family so we have we link with many of the old families around the world mm -hmm. and uh, a Rotarian for about 40 years so maybe oh, I bring some okay. of that experience to bear. Um, one of the things that uh, some of these gaps uh, require is, is the sort of mentoring of young people in those roles so that they can um, in, be enabled rather than disabled we are seeing, obviously, a labor force in the, um, the low education group in terms of fr fruit pickers and so on. But we're, we're also seeing highly intelligent people that are quite extraordinary. I mean, uh, I, I volunteer on a, on a food program in Vevey giving food to 280 families and 60 individuals. And when I talk to the people, you find that some of the people are professors of civil engineering, uh, we have an, a, an untapped resource. So we have an untapped resource in both directions. The people arbitrarily being uh, regarded as uh, non-effective and also the huge gaps in our society just because of the, uh, the birth uh, differences. Sorry, uh, Royston, just carry on. We'll, yeah, I think okay. the doctor thing is trying. Okay, well, look, um, what, what we find when, when we people come to the countries is that there's a, there's a major problem of assimilation. That's cultural, language, and so on. And the biggest challenge we find is self-worth issues, where people are often feel that they're marginalized, whether they are or not. Mm -hmm. And that particularly affects women who are migrants because often they're not treated in the same way as men. Um, we, we have, you know, there's lots of stories about uh, women who are economic migrants that are mistreated and abused. We have to find some way of picking that up. 
um, because many are just incredibly talented and we have to find a way where you know with the Bologna record on, on university qualifications we have acceptance of people that are educated in different countries we need to extend that to apprenticeships you know people that are bricklayers or whatever uh, in Switzerland it's quite difficult because if people have not been educated in Switzerland no matter how good they are there's a very difficult assimilation process and I think that's one of the key issues is celebrating people's talent trying to find some way of allowing qualifications to be considered universally and enabling rather than disabling people. Thank you. And unfortunately, we still haven't got Egerman back. Hopefully, he will get there. Um, Dr. Singh, would you like to go next? Yes. So as I suggested earlier, that I am in favor of universal right of access and development as there is a freedom of capital throughout the world freedom of right of capital throughout the world on the basis of return on investment similarly i am recommending there should be right of free movement of the talent throughout the world where is there is a maximum return of what I call flowering, flowering of human talent. And uh, beyond the environment, human talent uh, gets flourished and gets flowered. And, and we have this phenomena of what I call flood on the one hand and famine on the other. That is too much population in some areas and relatively too little population in other areas. Just to give one example, America has the area of three times more than India, but the population of America is only one fourth of that of India. So now, too many people, too little area, and too little uh, people, and too much area like Canada. So the, there is this uh, uh, gap between the supply on the one hand and demand on the other. And for that purpose, what we need to do is that the, the reason is why this hurdle is because the quality pe people with quality are welcome everywhere but if the skills are not developed then they are not welcome so they are to bridge this gap between demand and supply particularly see india for example has the youngest population of the people uh, of 67 percent below 40 years but america is aging china is aging japan is aging so, so to have the flow of this young people, uh, it is important that they, they should be having the quality. For that purpose, there is a need for coordination at global level, what I call global uh, talent and training and placement. And that is possible if there is this coordination at international level. And for that purpose, I am saying there are four players which are absolutely essential. One is universities what I call Ivy League universities. Second player are big business houses and big foundations like Bill Gates, Melinda Foundation. Uh, the third is naturally national laws. There is such a diversity of national laws. Sometimes they are conflicting. And fourth one, of course, is that at United Nations level, international level, United Nations can play much, much bigger role than what it is playing in the movement of this talent from where they are born to where they can flourish. And that's why I'm recommending that let there be 100 Harvard universities in 100 countries. So all the 100 countries of the world, particularly those who are on the bottom, should have at least one Harvard or Harvard kind of institution to train their people so that they have much more mobility. So with these kind of a coordination between universities, between big business houses, between national laws, and guided by, coordinated by United Nations, we can have this phenomena of flood and famine uh, can be bridged, and there can be truly global uh, brotherhood and relationship, which is the goal of all international organizations. As Dr. Royston pointed out, as Ambassador Eggman pointed out, as uh, the NAG was pointing out. And as Mohina, you yourself pointed out, 
a need for underutilized public private relationship thank you and egeman you disappeared you left us for a bit so we will go back to you and if you would like to well, continue uh, i i guess technology uh, is not as efficient as immigration sometimes uh, <laughs> yeah. as it has you're right <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i was saying that migration and income migration is not as bad as many european leaders or european countries think it is because uh, we have seen a lot of immigrants coming with new trade sometimes investment sometimes know how sometimes arts and crafts that all contribute to the social fabric of our country right now i would probably say the largest minority in turkey has become the syrian arab community you can see a lot of syrian restaurants opening in different parts of our large cities uh, you can see a lot of syrian jewelers coming up with new designs uh, we have some very promising potential football players or other sportsmen uh, very young aged and they're contributing and now they want to apply for turkish citizenship so they can compete for uh, international competition um, as you and i were talking about movie naim on netflix uh, which uh, shows the story of the turkish origin uh, weightlifter who grew up in bulgaria and then uh, migrated to turkey and then broke many world records and uh, his records are still unbreakable uh, he passed away unfortunately at a very young age but he is uh, Uh, your uh, volume him. has gone uh, yeah anyway no he still we can't hear you okay um we have uh just to go back to one of the points that both you Royston and now uh, you made um about women you know gender gaps exist women participate less in labor markets employment conditions are worse we know all of these now you add the migratory element into the equation and the problem goes uh, you know exponentially larger so if i could have both your thoughts on it and uh, dr singh would you just mute uh, yourself when you're not speaking because there's a lot of background noise yeah now royston either one uh, yeah i i'll go first thank you for the question again uh, the hard space in the labor market is definitely increasing and coming to the when you see 15% of the population of uh, migrants uh, and nico too when we have uh, the women leadership from the global bank city bank sorry i don't understand where the background noise is coming from do you, are you all hearing it because we are muted so i don't know yeah. okay it's okay. yeah it's better now carry okay. on okay so as i was saying um the the women leadership in the financial institutions uh, because i'm living in the new york so mostly we talk about the financial institution the like global economy as such um because i'm fascinated how the new york region develops almost 1.7 Seven trillion dollar economy, uh, or a three trillion dollar economy from Boston to Washington D.C., a 400 to 500 mile stretch. That's almost the fifth largest global economy contributes to the world economy. So, coming back to the the women leadership team in the financial institutions, most recently uh, the Citibank um, rightly hired or, or been promoted the women leadership as the CEO of the. take over the next ceo of the position um, coming back to one of the, the women leadership uh, the bank of the west nandita bakshi uh, indira noe obviously the pepsico uh, ceo and now she's on the board for amazon uh, and and other immigrant communities like satya narayana from microsoft or or sundar pichai from google uh, or even um, apple the late ceo steve jobs from the syrian immigrant and 
uh, everybody fascinates about innovation, Elon Mas from the Ukrainian immigrant, illegal immigrant, I would rather say. Uh, so their contributions and every business leader uh, definitely enforcing and promoting uh, women on the boards as well as how their contributions can be leveraged uh, in, into the global economy. I, I think that the message across the board resonates what we are currently doing, uh, promoting the women on, on being the face of the economy. Rather, it's it's become a more it's it's as a moral uh, imperative to be women on the board rather um, ignoring them in, in, the, in the labor market. Um, so uh, happy to continue on the conversation, Doctor. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Royston, also, would you comment on this, again, this gender aspect from uh, the point of view that looking at current migratory patterns, well, what I, role can women play? Well, so if I comment generically, firstly, um, we're dealing now in a world where we can't use accepted rules and based on history. The world is changing so rapidly. It's a new scenario every day. So agility is essential. And the masculine perspective is, tends to be very much command and control, whereas the feminine is very much uh, Im, sort of emotional and spiritual intelligence, which is working through relationships and inspirational leadership. And that's exactly what we need now, because uh, without that, we will carry on trying to maintain a status quo rather than lifting for a new beginning. So in this context, I think the women are so important um, and they need to be celebrated as migrants rather than, than sidetracked. Uh, and I think uh, I know from my Rotary experience, I was chair of the Rotarian Disaster Agency. Uh, and you know, if you've got 100,000 people there, uh, it's the women who are the survivors. They're the ones that actually make things happen. I remember in Africa, we gave plants to the men, came back two deep weeks later and they were dead. Gave them to the women, women and they came back later and there's fields of the stuff. So, this power of survival, this um, this ability to preserve, preserve the species, is in women, and I think uh, in migrants, I think that is a, is a talent which should be celebrated. I, I'm just going to disagree slightly on one thing that you said, Royston. You said men are about command and control, and women are about EQ and spirituality. How I'd like to define it, we are totally about command and control, but we just presented in a far more um, palatable manner. So I think that that's how I would like to describe it. Um, okay. I, I, I give in to the feminine view. <laughs> I know um, with a woman, the only answer is yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah there, there I may just add right to that. Sure. <clears throat> One of the things that we promote in, in, in the today's world is having the more women participation even in the conference. So I see there's a the gender disparity here, but hopefully the next year when we come back here, we'll have more women participation even in the panels like this. So thank you. Maybe I can make one last observation. I think uh, I tend to believe the soul's androgynous. So we need to feminine, we need to celebrate both the feminine and the masculine side. Well, and if you see true. Indian experience, if we see Indian experience, Indira Gandhi for 17 years was the only man in the cabinet. Um, Both ways. Yeah, that is true too. Uh, there was one factor that um, you know I thought was interesting, uh, especially I'm I'm in Muscat in Oman, and one of the things that we're looking at across the GCC and various other countries as well is return migration. Now this has been happening uh, over the last two years in the region. We've seen it go down anywhere between twelve to forty-one percent, the migrant workforce and. This has only uh, gone up significantly with the COVID scenario. I mean, in Oman alone, uh, from March, about 200,000 expatriate workers have either been laid off or decide to return. Now, this raises a question, how prepared, and this, could, this does happen across the world. Now, how prepared are the origin countries to absorb this workforce? And what implications are there, especially for the developing nations? Anyone? Origin countries, 
always welcome their sons and daughters and these people have come with lot of skills lot of exposure which can be properly coordinated can be utilized for the growth and development of these countries say for example in india lot of people who have studied abroad worked abroad when they come back they come out with lot of innovative ideas also and they take uh, the, the the indigenous economy to the next level and uh, we always welcome them though now of course various kind of motivations are also there religious differences are also there but still mother country always welcome them and particularly because of their exposure they bring lot of what i call flowering to 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 the country of origin and uh, particularly after education a lot of people i have seen those who have studied abroad but then for the work they come back to their own country and their quality and contribution is far richer had they not gone abroad so all this exposure of work and education enriches the country of origin uh egaman would you agree with that well uh partially yes partially no as i said migration uh, it comes with some uh difficulties but it can also be it can also have positive effects on uh both sides uh both the outgoing and the incoming uh, countries it just has to be managed well but i want to bring your attention to another issue that i want to raise is for example we have now more than two thirds of syria migrated either to jordan lebanon or turkey and uh, these people are trying to we can't hear you at the moment i oh, come back yeah yeah you you yeah. mean that yeah. um, a lot of countries european countries are telling turkey please stop these immigrants from moving to europe but they don't have it oh. gone off again You hear me now? Yeah. Now you're back. The, the reason these people have fled their country is because they fear for their lives. So we have to fix the problem back home, bring democracy to Syria so that they can go back to their own country where they belong. If we don't solve that, if we let the bloody dictator of Syria continue killing his own citizens, nobody would want to go back and they would not want to stay in Turkey. They want to go to Germany. they want to go to belgium they want to go to france and uh, these countries are just telling turkey please do whatever you can to make sure they don't come our way well there's so much we can handle but uh, we have to go to the source of the problem we have to start preparing some uh, areas some safety zones within syria where they would not be fearing to go and we have to build homes for them we have to build schools for them we have to build factories for them so they can continue to produce continue to help the global economy that's how we can really fight migration just by telling the countries like jordan or lebanon or turkey you deal with them and we will support your financial needs that's not really the solution if i could make an observation there i think the most important thing is we're dealing with human beings and i i think the answer for migration we've looked at africa for example which is a significant problem in sub sahara africa as well if you can rebuild the communities and you can have almost a small village mentality where you can celebrate difference then you can actually create a solution and it can be in a way that's self sustaining with by linking health education and enterprise one of the projects we're looking at is building a communities of roughly about 150 families with a school a health hub and an enterprise zone in the center which gives economic and social stability and if you build one every 30 kilometers then you can celebrate difference rather than be distracted by it 
And then you have an opportunity to deal with the situation in Syria and many other countries where you can give people a dream that they can fulfill. Absolutely, you're right on that. Uh, one of the other things, uh, COVID, how has it impacted? I mean, what are your feelings of each one? We could just go around the room. Um, how has it impacted migration? Because we're seeing all kinds of things happening as a result. I can take that from the, the New York point of view being the, the, the largest uh, uh, casualties, I would say, um, in the U.S. with over 200,000 plus counting perished because of the COVID uh, and over the 7 million population impacted um, because of the pandemic. Um, U.S. is probably the first nation to stop the migrant community. Um, as we speak, uh, they still close the borders to Canada. Um, some of the international flights are still canceled. Um, people cannot come into the U.S. on employment visas unless if you're an American citizen. Um, so there's a lot of uh, anguish um, about the travel restriction Again, uh, being an apolitical, because of the COVID, the social distancing norms and uh, the other measures, every country has to protect their own citizens. Uh, being the most favored nations, most travel to the U.S. Um, for employment, to meet their parents, the kids' education. So there's a multiple factors that influence why people move to the U.S., uh, I think that's been stopped. So there's a lot of uh, uh, anguish around the families that are not able to meet their parents. Um, I think it's a real cause, but at the same time, uh, you can't just blame politics playing here uh, just because it, it has the both sides of the same coin. So I, I, I understand uh, both my parents are still in, in India, and in the last six months, I did not go. My last visit was the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, in the neck of the moment, I moved from India on the March 5th, uh, wearing a mask. But when I landed in the Newark airport, the world is peaceful here because nobody's wearing a mask. So from the contrasting viewpoint of you, uh, in the last six months, um, I, I think the lot of unhappy people around. Um, but hopefully the, the, the things will change as we move to the COVID vaccination is coming uh, in the coming months. Um, so hopefully by 2021 and the future will be much brighter for the immigration community uh, and we will see the happy faces around the globe. Please go ahead. I want to bring your attention that one of the most complicated states in the world is probably United Kingdom, where both the prime minister and the crown prince were infected. And <laughs> yes. a lot of people living in 10 cities in different parts of the world are doing okay. If you think about it, a refugee, an immigrant, uh, has already taken a lot of risks. So fearing corona is going to be a secondary issue for them. And if you look at the world, members of the security, permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations, who are supposed to protect all of us, have been the biggest victims of corona, whereas many small countries have done much better in terms of dealing with it. So the corona might have some impact on migration, but it has a bigger impact on the broader global population, and it teaches us to live better, to share more, to take care of ourselves and increase our immunity. Just be better neighbors in general. Exactly. Royston, do you have any well, I, I'm very much in the thick of the COVID situation, having given ev evidence that the Royal Society is yeah. damaging it. Um, firstly, it's difficult to understand how vaccination will work because you can only vaccinate against a strain or group of strains of the virus, and it's mutating at a huge rate. At least Therefore, 30. Yeah, at least 30 at the moment, and maybe more. Uh, and we see some particularly vicious ones in China and uh, the Middle East, you know, the MERS virus in the Middle East. So 
I think the, the biggest issue, I think, is managing fear. You said that the people in the, in the, uh, um, the camps had actually managed huge amounts of fear, therefore they were relatively immune to coronavirus, which is another challenge on the, uh, on, on the horizon. Uh, we, w what I would say is, is that when we map it, is that neighbourliness and working together as families to help each other is the most important thing. I think we've run out of time now. Yes, we have. I'm just going to do this picture thing, group fee. I refuse to say the word, but I had to. I'm just going to do that now. Yeah. Group fee. I have. Oh, how does this work? Control uh, all. You know, I'm seeing uh, group fee, but it now it just says take a photo. Yeah. But this shouldn't we take a selfie? It should have been. What? It's not working. Can can you try it? Selfie. No, it, it should be a group fee. Ah. But it's I not. think everybody has to take the selfie first. Their own, and, and then yeah. Okay, can you all do that, please? Then we can add it together. Yeah, I've done it. <laughs> it says three people for each selfie. Yeah. Waiting for all attendees. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I thought it's just going to show us all together. Uh, airbrushing is an extra option, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then? And then what? Are we finished? No, there's somebody who hasn't taken. I think I've done it. If, uh... Hang on, shall I do it again? Uh... Yeah, I think there's something. No, it says. Do you know who's not taken it? No, it's not showing me that. It just says four of us have. Oh, I'll take a photo again. That's the easiest way. Is it there? It still says four. For whatever reason. Um, Why four? Hmm? Okay. So I think we'll just, one second, we'll know just now. Uh, who was in it? Ah, Royston, you didn't. Shall we just take another one if you like so it. that you're there? I'm just going to delete this. Can you just, yeah. Can everyone just please take another one? Okay. One second. Two people finished. Two people. Three, four. <laughs> This is fine. Royston, this is Royston. We're just <laughs> going to miss you every time. What is happening with you? I keep on taking the photo. Oh, we've got it. We've got it. We've got it. Just, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's cracking the lens or something. Yeah? Oh, here we go. Rendering final photo. Great. Yes, we yeah. got it. We got the trees as well. Yeah? Wonderful. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank and, you, uh, you know, it was really great talking to you all. And uh, I, I will send an email so that, you know, Agaman, uh, now I want your email and all of that so that we have each other's emails. And it was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for the great moderation. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. you we log out or we continue on the... Uh, yeah, we, we anyway exit the session. Oh, please. Thank you. Just need to work out how I do that, yeah? Yes, it's not working for me either. Oh, God. I not uh, you need to log out. Uh, you no, I'm trying. Okay. Uh, I think we are only the two here. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> um... It's not immediately obvious how you exit the session. Correct, yeah. Uh, pressing all the buttons here. Um, ah, I've found a door. Maybe that's it. Here we go. You close it or...? When in doubt, switch off, yeah? Oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> oh.